going to talk to you about biological evolution and what kinds of consequences it might have um, for our topic. First of all, I mean, as the usual default thing, thanks for inviting me. This is my third time in Singapore, and a uh, special, special thanks to Jan and Karen for arranging all these things. I really enjoyed it. And for this little enduring group, uh, I would like to start in media race. Uh, you are built of cells that you know, but curiously enough, the cells that you are built of, mostly, are not the simplest ones. The simplest ones are the bacterial cells, and the bacterial cell is as simple as this thing here. Looks like a so-called cell organelle in biology, and there was a hell of a lot of time between the origin of bacteria and between the, the origin of the so-called eukaryotic cells. Um, just this example by itself, that there is more to evolution than just the, you know, the switch from one gene form to another. Something much more dramatic, much more exciting has happened during evolution. Complexity, by whatever sensible means, has dramatically increased, at least along certain lineages. The question is, how and why is that so? Um, let me just uh, remind ourselves that uh, this kind of uh, insight about the so-called symbiogenetic complexity, whereby you combine two things in order to have a higher level pool, is not so new. But it was not terribly popular because it was proposed by Mereshkovsky in 1910, um, where he said that if you look at eukaryotic cells under the light microscope, certain parts of the eukaryotic cell uh, look like bacteria. And since he was uh, working on lichens, he saw that probably it's the end of symbiosis and they were once free living. Moreover, the gap for the eukaryotic host cell, you know, that bank that contains all these things, that looked so complex to, me, to him that he actually drew a phylogenetic tree with two roots. Huh? One for the bacteria proper and one for the eukaryotic cell. Don't laugh, I don't blame him. The only reason why we today accept that these must be related is because of the molecular evidence. If you look at the DNA in both cells, in your cells and in bacteria, there is a relationship. The relationship is far from complete. One third of your genes have no counterparts whatsoever in any bacterium today, so there is a big yeah, in fact, from Cavalier's Miss Wright, he says, that's the biggest evolutionary discontinuity in the history of all the biota. The transition from the bacterial to the eukaryotic cell is far bigger than anything that happened ever since, including the origin of language and humans and whatever. So we have to appreciate this dimension that was realized in a rudimentary form by Mereshkovsky, and then, of course, later took on, uh, uh, Lynn Margulis took it on beautifully, and she was consciously looking back at this old literature, of course, to combine this new data. Now, uh, evolution biologists, uh, um, since Darwin, want to understand these processes in terms of these criteria, and it's actually very exciting that you can summarize the basic concepts of the Darwinian theory on one slide. Daniel Dennett famously wrote a book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He could have written Darwin's infuriating idea exactly because he has a simple explanation for very complex phenomena. And that thought by itself is infuriating to many people, as we know from experience, that this can be done. Many people prefer complex explanations for complex phenomena. Well, sometimes you cannot do better than that. But if you can, you better go for uh, the simple one, as simple as possible, but not simpler, as somebody also famously said. By the way, the idea was, so to speak, around the air. At that time, there was a guy, um, uh, at the time of Darwin, who published a paper in the Horticultural Monthly. It's hardly a terribly scientific journal from our uh, contemporary standards. And in a few pages, he did summarize 
the essence of the Darwinian theory. Darwin didn't know about it. The guy wrote to Darwin and said, look, uh, Mr. Darwin, I admire the origin of species, but actually I published the idea before. And Darwin did say, yes, you are absolutely right. The idea is there. And even in the Arab world, and therefore, such as before, and centuries before, the, where the basic idea was already figured out. So it's not so terribly complicated. In a way, it's obvious. It's obvious with uh, some deep thinking about such phenomena. Now, this is a formidable gentleman. Uh, uh, looks a bit formidable. Hardly anybody knows about him today. Uh, he is. John Herschel, uh, he is the, uh, related to the, to the other uh, famous Herschel. And he said, when he wrote, uh, they read the, the origin of species, well, this is, uh, Darwin explains the law of higgledy piggledy. And by this, we, he meant, I think, something that we today now um, associated with complexity. Right? He was well trained in mathematics, and he said two things that this. Uh, is, is lacking, you know, this uh, mathematical beauty that other natural laws have, for example, the law of gravitation, and also it is something that uh, is not uh, well related to the idea of God. It's not at the right level, you know, what uh, Darwin said. Now, here is, on the other hand, Boltzmann, and Boltzmann uh, later realized that, in fact, there is something extremely exciting here. He said that what Darwin did was an intuitive um, statistical mechanics of biological populations. And this insight made Boltzmann say that it will be, uh, the 20th century will be the century of Darwin, exactly because of uh, this insight that shows that, of course, uh, what we think about mathematical rigor and mathematical adequacy must be a result of further evolution itself. Now, when we go along with this, we further get into something interesting, that, for example, Darwin has deeply regretted in his correspondence that he didn't go into mathematics, because he said that uh, people uh, apparently, with a good command of mathematics, have an extra sense, you know, which, uh, the, which enables them to consider these things in a way uh, which is not all bad for the, the guys who are not uh, mathematically minded. And then my intellectual grandfather, J.B.S. Spalding, also said, an ounce of algebra is worth a form of verbal argument. It's actually true, and if you can do it, then you should probably do it. Now, um, this is a slide where there is something important I want to convey. Um, this is the the uh, this is a this is a very simple slide with a number of growth laws, and these growth laws um, are very well known. If you take this one here, and there is a there is a growth term here. Right? And if k times x plus x raised to the power of p. If p is 1, that's exponential growth. And that is the Darwinian case. If you have two uh, exponentially growing things together, one of them will reach infinite concentration relative to the other, even if growth is unlimited. That not many people appreciate that. And most of the people would assume that actually it doesn't matter you have the same thing as if p is bigger than 0. However, this is not the case. This is not the case, and there are some very interesting consequences of that. So for example, if p is bigger than 1, then growth is hyperbolic. What does it mean? That means that the same very simple equation would reach infinite population numbers in finite time. It has got a singularity, which means that if you start growing first, you are going to win. Even if the value k, which is the measure of per capita fitness, as you say in biology, your interest rate, so to speak, as a population, would be bigger. 
Eh? If you start it early, you are already common, you will suppress the other guys. It's a deviation from the survival of the fittest, it's survival of the common. Again, so this was the second. That was discovered by Manfred Eigen in 1971. And then he said, yeah, but uh, you have actually exponential growth if P is bigger than, uh, than zero, uh, which would be the linear growth. It's not true again, as I demonstrated in uh, the late 80s. If, you, if P is between zero and one, you have parabolic growth. Parabolic growth means that it's a parabolic, again, it goes to infinity infinite time as exponential growth. But if two curves are growing together, you actually go to a stable ratio between the two. Unlike in exponential growth, where one of them will go for, to infinity relative to the other. This has the consequence of survival of everybody with a little bit of selectivity. Um, this I'm saying because these are extremely simple insights, but I think they are absolutely important to the dynamics of complex phenomena. Not some, for some strange reason, not many people are aware of these very simple things yet. Um, many mathematicians wouldn't know the behavior of this system. They would say, yeah, well, something like exponential. Absolutely not. There is a qualitative difference. Now, for example, in the case of economy, the hyperbolic case corresponds to increasing returns, right? And increasing returns leads to that phenomena, especially those that are uh, knowledge incentive, which I call the survival of the common. If you, have a, if you have already established yourself, then it's actually, it can be very difficult for others to break in, and there are several reasons why it is. For example, if you have produced something, a recorder, according to a certain code, you know, and then you are selling other things that use the same code, and you start it early, obviously you will find that people are not going to be happy to switch to another one. So these are the kinds of things that uh, give you an uh, increasing return on investment. Um, uh, just as a side note, because we had a uh, lovely lecture on economics, uh, for biologists, um, the notion of multiple equilibria resulting from the nonlinearities was a natural thing ever since the investigations of Lotka and Volterra in the golden age of theoretical ecology, that's 1930s. Now compare this with, um, with a quotation from Schumpeter, uh, something from the 50s actually, where he says uh, that, um, that uh, basically multiple equilibria are distasteful, um, and, with, and he says that, uh, um, uh, where is this? Uh, um, exact, uh, this, from the standpoint of any, exact, of any exact science, the existence of a uniquely determined equilibrium is, of course, of the utmost importance, even, even if proof has to be purchased at the price of very restrictive assumptions, without any possibility of proving the existence of a uniquely determined equilibrium, or at all events of a small number of possible equilibria, at however high level of abstraction, a field of phenomena is really a chaos that is not under analytical control. That's exactly the case why I believe, even now, many people find the whole idea of complexity and complex science repulsive. It's exactly this kind of thing which is articulated by him much earlier in a very clear way. Now, all this, all this preparation, I would like to get into this question. So this kind of dynamic, the different kinds of growth, uh, the Darwinian dynamics, as you could summarize them, what kind of things it, could, it, it was leading to. And it was leading to many things. And this is the 95 <coughs> rendering of what we call the major transition revolution. On the left, you see the state of affairs before the transition. And on the right, you see the state of affairs after the transition. Um, you see that it starts replicating molecules, both the population of molecules in protocells, and uh, then ends this pre-linguistic society that goes to human societies with language, because we think that in all these transitions, a selection on hereditary information played an absolutely critical role. Uh, in contrast, for example, the origin of writing, 
uh, whereas, of course, uh, you are mo mobilizing a lot of biological resources when you write, and you can have impairments that affect the writing ability. We don't think that there was um, a significant selection uh, on the genetic variation uh, behind writing. So these are, in that sense, still biological transitions. Um, I wrote it uh, together with uh, the late John Maynard Smith. And there are some transitions that uh, are marked by Asterix, and those transitions are regarded as difficult. And now difficulty can mean two things. Either it means that you are stupid and it's difficult for you to understand, which is, of course, uh, very bad to in many cases for every scientist. The other thing is, however, that it was genuinely difficult for biological evolution. And what it could mean is, again, two things. First, it can be difficult because uh, it was difficult to get the right numbers on the genetic lottery, which means it, uh, the transition is variation limited. Or the other thing is that it was difficult because uh, there was something very special about the environmental conditions, which means the transition was selection limited. We believe that, for example, the origin of the genetic code from the RNA world to uh, DNA genes and protein enzymes, that was a Variation-limited transition it was genetically a difficult kind of thing. And nowadays, um, we tend to think that the transition to the linguistic society was, was more selection-limited. Uh, it was related to a very particular circumstance that uh, we had to uh, face. Now, this is already out, so that's an old slide. I have reworked the whole theory. Uh, that is now major transition theory 2.0, and it summarizes uh, new things. And uh, uh, probably we'll, we'll get to that, but it's actually good to ask what are the commonalities in these transitions. And uh, well, there are a few commonalities that are very important, and I would say, because these were so important for 3.5 billion years of biological evolution, I would tell to Jan, and this audience, that these considerations I probably are worthy of taking into account when you want to use a complexity lens, because for 3.6 billion years, these have to be proven to be absolutely essential ingredients for uh, a radical increase in complexity. So one of them is that independently reproducing units come together to form a higher level rule. Think of the eukaryotic cell. Your mitochondria were once free-living bacteria more than two billion years ago, right? The second one is that you have division of labor or the combination of function, depending on some things we will see soon. Then, what is very important is that you had origin of novel inheritance systems. Um, many people talk about DNA and so on, and that's of course, absolutely right. But there was a lot before and below DNA, and after and above DNA, that was important for inheritance. For example, if you didn't have epigenetic inheritance, which means that you can inherit the cell state, when you, and you, your liver cell divides, even if you don't get cancer, it gives rise to a liver cell. And it was not a liver cell before, because it arose through differentiation, and that is what we call by epigenetic inheritance. So this is an absolutely important things, and uh, uh, people thinking about complexity have to think about uh, these mechanisms. And then, are, of course, there are these very interesting things, uh, which uh, in many cases happen, is, uh, for example, contingent irreversibility. What it does it mean? That in many cases, you find in the transitions that there is no way back. Is it a logical thing, a logical necessity, or is it contingent? Actually, in many cases, it's not logical, but it is so difficult to go back for, that for all practical purposes, it doesn't happen. So for example, uh, uh, you know that there is the case of parthenogenesis, which means that some of the eukaryotic creatures have given, have given up sex, for better or worse, but they don't have sex any longer. But there are certain groups of organisms that you never find uh, uh, parthenogenetic organisms. For example, the gymnosperms, like uh, Christmas trees and similar things. Why? 
because it was found out that um, uh, it's very interesting that the, the plastic, the organelle for photosynthesis carried by one of the uh, gametes, and the other gamete from the other sex carries the mitochondrial to the zygote. So if you would like to give up sex in that group, you should solve two difficult problems together. To give, it, give up the genetic machinery first to begin with, and somehow solve the problem that you are not devoid of mitochondria at the same time, and that for all practical purposes cannot happen. Right? This is this contingent irreversibility, and of course central control in many cases after the transition increase in order to solidify the system, uh, which means that, for example, your mitochondria today are largely controlled by the cell nucleus, for example. Because, of course, it has a selective advantage. Your life cycle becomes more orderly. The whole thing works you know, more like a machinery. Actually, I would like to make a statement. And I think you would probably find analogous uh, cases in several other layers of organization. Um, we are struggling with the, with the phenomenon of complexity. And in our group at the table, before my talk, we said that Oh, yes, you have the complex system, but if you have the possibility of cutting the complex system by the joints, you bloody well should do it. Now, in complex systems in biological evolution, there are two kinds of complexity. Where for, for one, it is easy to, relatively easy to do the other thing, for the other, it's not so easy. So for the organisms, it is much easier to cut them by the joints than, from, than for ecosystems, right? And the reason for that, that typically ecosystems are not units of selection, which means that there is no, there hasn't been selection for the regularity of the repetition of the life cycle. It's this regularity of the life cycle that gives the machine-like capacities of organisms and this is why we are undoubtedly, by many measures, complex systems. Nevertheless, you can actually have things like medicine and many other things. For ecosystems, it's a lot harder because it's a mess. So that, that I call horizontal complexity. We are talking with the major transitions about the vertical complexity, uh, how organismal complexity became more and more important. Now, David Quella, in a, in a very nice uh, uh, review of our book actually has developed the theory further. So he distinguishes between egalitarian and fraternal transitions. And the egalitarian transitions are those where the units that come together are not equal, <coughs> like in the case of the eukaryote itself. In the other cases, they are equal to begin with. If you go to multicellularity, for example, then in many cases of multicellularity, you start with a simple process that you divide and you remain together. But when you do that, to begin with, you are equal, right? And so in the, for the egalitarian transitions, um, you have a combination of functions because these are different. But in the fraternal transitions, you have to avoid division of labor because they are alike to begin with. And the difficulties, uh, um, uh, and and uh, are different, of course, for the same kind of thing. So, for you see, in this, uh, the greatest hurdle in the case of egalitarian transitions is the control of conflict. Of why? Yeah, because they are different, and they were original different populations to begin with. In the case of the fraternal transitions, usually it's the initial advantage is which is not trivial, right? One cell. Two cells, they are the same, stick together. Where well, you could say that in any case, it's a disadvantage, for example, because your surface gets diminished and whatever. So these uh, two things, coming together from independent lineages or staying together and then form a more complexified lineage, they have different kinds of uh, consequences. Also, the, 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 the kind of uh, way how you control conflict is different. In the case of the fraternal transitions is kinship. Your cells in your body are practically uh, fully related to each other. 
So it's not such a great miracle that you have a germline which you pass on to the next generation and your body sadly dies. Right? That's, uh, you can calculate this, is, this can actually happen in this case easily. But of course, uh, in the eukaryotic cell, there is no way that the mitochondrion can do the reproduction for the plastid or vice versa because these are different kinds of things, qualitatively speaking. Therefore, the control of conflicts must follow different uh, lines, like sitting in the same boat. Uh, well, 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 I'm jumping about certain things. Yeah, but not about this one. So I would like to give you an example of, of, an, of a very early conflict. Uh, in 1971, Manfred Eigen um, considered, uh, came up with a theory of uh, macromolecular evolution, and he realized one important thing. He realized that, the, that uh, since uh, replication in early times must have been very error prone, therefore the early genetic information must have been very short. Now, with a very uh, short genetic information, you cannot do much as a general, right? So, uh, how do you start life? You know, you would say that you need at least a few genes. Yes, then, then you say, okay, if the chromosome would be too error prone, yeah, just let's have, you know, uh, genes that are, are not linked together, but you have a collection of cooperating genes. Fine, but as we have just learned from the egalitarian transitions, they will have differential replication rates. And even though they would need each other, since they are unlinked, one of them will have a competitive advantage relative to all the others, and the whole system goes down the drain. This is what we call Eigen, Eigen's paradox. So this has to be resolved somehow. And he uh, proposed the hypercycle as a resolution, a hypercycle. I'm telling you because also in complexity theory, some people uh, still face this idea. Uh, that you have uh, replicating agents, and the replicating agents also have the, the replication of each other. Right? And, and this is ecologically stable. It's an exercise to the reader to prove it that if, if, if that is all what is happening, then it is ecologically stable. However, if you have uh, the possibility of parasites, uh, then this is not so anymore. So, as Maynard has figured out, if you have P1, and the arrow leading to P1 is stronger than the other arrows, this is going to kill the system irrespective of the other details. This is the problem that you know the ecosystem is not a unit of selection. This is a molecular ecosystem. So something has to be done about this problem. And the problem is that you have to call somehow keep the cheaters at bay. This is the, this is the point that I was explaining to you. In order to have a higher level unit, you must somehow suppress the, uh, the competitive tendencies of the lower level <coughs> units. And uh, um, here is a way how to do it. So imagine that you have what different replicators, and different replicators uh, 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 contribute to the common good, which is OK. But again, it would be the case that although it's a common good, some of them would be replicating faster than the other. And that would mean that there would be selection uh, by the fittest uh, version against all the others. If uh, that's the case, then what can you do? Well, here is what uh, you can do. You have to put it on a surface. This is very interesting. So you, because everybody was thinking as a, uh, of the dynamics as a Bellesberg flow reactor, if you have, however, you put the dynamics onto a surface, then you have a very interesting phenomenon. The interesting phenomenon is that you, you, um, you have the following case, that if you have a good replicator, then the good replicator is going is likely to find another good replicator in its neighborhood, which means that with a great uh, probability, it is going to be uh, the case that the good the other good replicator is going to reciprocate, right? This is skin selection on the rocks, right? And this is an absolutely absolutely important thing, and uh, this is how you can get off the ground in an otherwise seemingly impossible situation. 
And this is a simulation that we did. So what happens is that if the molecules interact with their neighbors and it's not you know, a hodgepodge, then the uh, replication fidelity will go up in the population and the efficiency of the enzymes will also increase in the population. Uh, <clears throat> yes, of course, another stronger version of this dynamics is when you are sitting in the same boat. When you are sitting in the same boat as different replicators contributing to the common good, then it's not a good idea to rock the boat, right? Because the boat, the boat will, will sink with you. And this is what is called the stochastic corrector model. And this is a very important thing, also a very important lesson, that in such cases, the population absolutely survives on the variance that is generated across the different protocells upon division. There is an internal tendency to become worse and worse, but when you divide the black and the white guys, all of them can choose whether you go to the upper cell or to the lower cell. This will generate variation between the protocells, on which variation the natural selection at the level of the cells can act. Ladies and gentlemen, this is very important. This is what we call multi-level selection in biology. This is one of the earliest and extremely well-analyzed model. It's deeply rooted in the, in the stochastic processes. And so the point is that there is, a, there is a deterministic tendency to go wrong, which is countered by selection at the higher level. And then this kind of internal competition can be kept at bay. This is how the egalitarian transition usually happens. This is how you can rationalize it. Now, of course, uh, uh, you can always ask, is this just theory? Or can you actually do something experimental about this? So you shouldn't talk, uh, only talk the talk, but also walk the walk. And we have been doing that. This is just to sh show something important that, if possible, uh, when you are facing these issues, you know, how you can raise in complexity and so on, try to come up with, a, with an experiment at least some fraction of the thing, right? Because in natural science, it's ultimately the lab that saves our soul. Don't kid yourself. Ultimately, it's the experiment. That is what uh, in so many other disciplines are lacking. So what we did uh, is that we put uh, the whole life cycle of the stochastic corrector model into a microfluidic device. And with this microfluidic device, we did uh, get this kind of molecular cooperation with the selection proce processes that uh, uh, operate. And then you can take an imaginary, this is the important thing, you can take an imaginary intermediate stage in biological evolution create the experiment, and by this experiment, in a way, recreate the inter interim stage, and test whether the interim stage works, as you predicted from mathematical theory. So it's a classical natural science loop. Of course, I don't want to go into the details of that. Now, um, there are, of course, many things, but what, there, are, there are a few, yeah. Uh, um, that is going probably to the last two topics. So uh, in the PNAS paper, the Transition Theory 2.0, I have uh, identified a number of novel type of transitions. One of them is what I call filial transition. The filial transition is when you evolve a novel Darwinian system, not above the level that you already have, but within. But I think it's extremely important. Huh? There's a Darwinian system that happens within a Darwinian system. It wasn't there before. And that's the adaptive immune system in the vertebrates. You know, your immune system, part of it works by producing antibodies against antigens, incoming invaders. How do you do it? You have a generative system, whereby you can make many molecules, potential antibodies, and there is an internal selection in the body that ensures 
that uh, there will be an increased match between the antigen and the antibody. It's a Darwinian system. It's, so to say, artificial selection run by the organism in order to conquer the invaders. Of course, it's extremely important. And also, um, this is actually a Nobel Prize speech of Yerne. The generative grammar of the universe is beautiful because it has to element the generative grammar and uh, this potential of the Darwinian dynamics. Moreover, it has been proven that the, that the space of the antibody repertoire very nearly covers the possible shape space. So it is general in the sense similar to language. It is general because in this language you can cover the, the semantic space um, uh, to a very large extent. So that's one of the things. The other thing that I wanted to mention at the end, oh yeah, uh, I cannot resist this. So, uh, so you would say that such a idiosyncratic, bloody difficult system, that it must have originated once. Not true. In the vertebrates, it originated twice. So if you look at the, all the vertebrates have an autoimmune system, but if you look at the details, here on the left you see the arrangements of the jawless fish. And then everybody else. The details show that they are, they have evolved independently. They are analogous, they are doing the business in the same way, but actually there were two uh, pathways leading to that particular solution. Why only in the vertebrate that I'm going to tell in a paper that is in preparation that comes later? Now finally, uh, then we get to the point of language, which is hell of a lot, hell of a problem. Somebody called the origin of language the hardest problem of science today. Why? One of the reasons is that we have got three interwoven time scales, and you cannot neatly separate them when you are thinking about the problem. So we have biological evolution with genetic selection. Then you have individual learning, because it's the learning capacity that the gene specify. Then, using individual learning, you pick up elements of a rudimentary language, but also you pass it on, and there's the cultural transmission. Ha! Ah, but it becomes a loop, because when you are evolving it, your success as a biological individual will depend on how well you communicate with something which is a cultural product, right? So the so-called fitness landscape of the biological population is going to be determined partly by the cultural landscape and will feel factor. <coughs> of course, as if you're a complexity theory, theorist, then you will feel that, ah, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, but try to do some sensible work. Uh, it's not easy to say the least. Um, so that's one of the difficulties why this uh, other uh, this problem is so difficult. The, the other one is the following. Uh, to cut a long story short, nobody else uh, seems to have this. I know, and nobody else seems to have this adaptation. For example, <coughs> birds. Birds have a kind of grammar, uh, some of them. The singing birds have a kind of grammar, but it is not the same type of grammar that we have. It is called finite state grammar. It's a simple form of grammar. Some birds can learn words, but they don't have grammar. <laughs> the combination of, uh, of recursive grammar this complicated symbolic reference is unique to humans. Whatever you do with animals, the combinations you don't get in other animals. Even under artificial conditions, it's impossible. So uh, one of the most important uh, uh, anatomists of all times, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, in his autobiography, with somewhat oldish language, but in a, with an eminent uh, honesty, asked the question, where are the original resources? to account you know, for this difference. And he figured out that somehow it must be related to capacity of the brain. That doesn't mean that 
Okay, that doesn't mean that the, the brain defines the cultural environment, but you need a processing capacity to handle the cultural thing, and that seems to not to be there in the other animals. It is, seems to be there. But what is it, right? In a way, that's the holy grail. And uh, one possible answer, I don't want to be in the discussion that we are going to have with Jan uh, tomorrow, probably this is what I will use as a provocation, there are hints today that in the nervous system, despite the fact that normally neurons don't reproduce, there is a Darwinian system, among other things, like the immune system. The immune system has many components. Many of them are not Darwinian. But it now seems to be the case that there is a Darwinian or very Darwinian-like component in the brain. Uh, one of them, one of the illustrations, is uh, related to structural plasticity. Now, what does it mean? Uh, it's still not uh, widely known. Structural plasticity means that while you are sitting here, now this is amazing, while you are sitting here, some of your synaptic connections between neurons will disappear and others are going to be created. This is an ongoing exploration process, and it's very costly. Think of the terms of the molecular biosynthesis. This has a lot of energy to do that. And these things in biology don't happen without a strong adaptive advantage. What is probably the case, and that would be another lecture, but I would like to end with this point, that the rudiments of an evolutionary search system are there probably in all mammals and all birds. But only in the human lineage you got to something which we call in the major transitions unlimited heredity. What the unlimited heredity means that the number of hereditary states on which you can make potential selection is for all practical purposes infinitely large. So this within nervous system, Darwinian process, because of the unlimited heredity that the nervous mechanisms produce, but only in the human lineage, were probably the key for things uh, like language, which in the cultural domain also had this open-endedness and inexhaustible possibility for generation and testing variations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Joe. <laughs> all the different complexities in biology to give us helpful insight into our own complexity. Any questions for us? And while he is going to take the question session, I'm going to load the next presentation as our deterministic approach was interrupted by the complex weather systems. Jan. Yes. I, I think this was absolutely great, Urs. And one reason is you, the thought came up in my mind, which must have come up in your mind a long time ago, that when we look as non-biologists at complex systems, we actually ignore the fact that through your work, and, and at least that's the way I perceive it, it may be totally wrong, so please uh, say so if that is the case. A lot of mechanisms that we think are, uh, uh, that, that form the, the dynamics of, of um, complex systems that we try to study by all means except biology, have already been identified in biology. And so one of the key in, in the transitions that you describe, and so the, one of the key issues that might be emerging out of this uh, this uh, this talk from you and, and and maybe out of this 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 workshop is to find ways to introduce the kind of dynamics that you describe into our description and our is not the right way but in the description of complex systems that we try to to, to look at through the lens. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Uh, Thank you very much. I agree with you, but it's much better that you said it. <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, no, this is actually serious because um, there, there is a very strong, uh, um, how should I say, justification 
for saying that, in fact, Darwin was the first complexity theorist. Right? He did not have the mathematical means, but if you read the original speeches, I mean, he was, you know, tackling issues that relate to nowadays all the time, right? So he recognized, and as I said in later, when, when, uh, when, uh, uh, in the 1930s, two very important scientific movements emerged. One was theoretical ecology, the other was, was population genetics, right? These were, you know, dealing with the, the statics of complex systems, that's a lot Caboterra and the others, and the other one was dealing with dynamics of complexity, of a particular, okay, it was not a general theory, but, you know, it's a big field, you know, biology is a big field by itself, and uh, I think that they have done an incredible good, I don't want to give a second lecture, but there is something that I want, because people are making so much fuss about things like artificial life, you know, not life as it is, but life as it could be. Yeah, actually in, in 1930, in Fisher's book, you find the following question. Uh, he says, no practical biologist would be willing to, today, would be willing to work out the consequences of having more than two sexes, yet, yet, what else should he do if he wants to understand why, after all, the number of sexes is two. Okay, so he figures out that you have to do an artificial life type of investigation in order to uh, get the answer in this broader framework that narrows it down again to what we know from practical biology. I mean, this is what I, I tend to annoy the artificial life people with, you know, that uh, you should read a little bit the literature, it's not bad for you. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to introduce uh, Graham, who's. Uh...